So you only have two songs you kind of, you know, usually if I do a gig somewhere, I don't make plans. I kind of, you know, on the way down to the gig, I might decide what song I'm going to start with. It might be a dog song, you know. Dogs can hear things that we can't hear. So maybe I'm singing right now for the dog. And that's why the dog's all excited, you know. But when you only have two songs, I do make my mind up. And I thought I would do this one. You know, because we're a bunch of Americans out here in this place. And most, most people in this country have, have a lot of American stuff in their heads. And uh, whether we care to admit it or not, this country was actually founded on war. And it initially was a large-scale um, continental occupation. So we have loved, officially, we have loved wars and occupations since the beginning. So to walk around and say that that isn't true is a little disingenuous. To walk around and say that Americans don't want war is to not pay attention because they do. Why aren't they here? We're a minority. That we could become a majority. We could become enough to make a difference. But right now we're, I posted on Facebook a couple of pictures of when, when Medea Benjamin was in town just a few days ago, right? And she got canceled from the bookstore and then she got canceled from the church, right? And I went down there and I took a, a couple of pictures and I posted them. And it instantly turned into this shouting match argument between, between people who were saying I was a Putin supporter because I was advocating talking, you know, and people that were back and forth and screaming at each other. This is a very contentious thing. And we need to be smart and we need to keep going and we need to not fool ourselves. America was founded on war and occupation. It's in the DNA. So it, the only way to stop it is to change it. Fundamentally. So this song is called Shadow in the Room. It goes like this. Yeah. as bad it always is it shutters down the line people close their eyes and ears and leave their minds behind and the only answers they take are what is already known and the shadow in the room begins to grow the death toll mounts and I decide for every face and name everybody points a finger says the other one is to blame and vengeance is a hungry thing, it will not be satisfied. The shadow in the room won't take the side. The right of God's to give and take is taken for the law by those who stand to gain the most from such a fatal flaw and ideologies to justify what would otherwise be moot. The shadow in the room is absent. secret place you won't find on any map where the world is a chessboard move the pieces up and back oh and those who get the most are those who use the biggest guns and the shadow of the room knows how it's done there's another pretty pop star with endless melodies everybody loves the ball game but it saps their energies and it's better to be entertained than it is to have to think when the shadow in the room becomes distinct. The shadow like an animal has been there all along 
An elephant or an albatross, whatever fits your song, whatever you won't look at, because it interrupts your game, and it will never disappear without a name. It's the knot inside your thinking, it's the shadow on the sun, it's whatever you have to deal with before you can get anything done. It's what your enemy has been trying to tell you all along. And it's the only thing worth singing in a song. this movement and we always welcome performers, people who perform poems, whatever, in order to advance this struggle. So our next speaker comes from La Resistencia, which is a grassroots organization led by undocumented immigrants based in Washington State, working to end the detention of immigrants and stop deportation. Please welcome Maru. Thank you everyone. Hola, buenas tardes. My name is Maru, I'm the founder of La Resistencia. We came all the way from Tacoma. We're in a rush because we have to go get back and continue fighting against the detention center. It's been 20 years, too long of ICE, way too long. But this is not new. We've been fighting for centuries against the European invasion of our continent. And we continue fighting against capitalism, which is the root cause of our migration in the first place. We were forced to leave. We didn't want to leave. We should like to go back. But then we have works like this across the world that are just excusing the uh, usage of money that is our money. We're here because we're the creditors. We came from where it was taken from us. All the money, all the resources, everything that was taken from us, we're here because we're going to take it back. And we're going to continue pushing not only for the right to migrate, the right to cross every place we need to cross, but also the right to stay, the right to go back and the right to live freely without the fear of walking and finding police or eyes around us. The fear of being placed in cages just so, so a few can make tons of money out of us. We we'll continue fighting so our families are not separated, they're not divided. We will continue fighting until this Congress stops using us as their political pawn in the border to militarize and give further business and further contracts to uh, companies such as Boeing and Amazon to continue militarizing our presence and also the digital surveillance against our communities. We want to stop and we are here today because we believe in this. We believe that there should be nowhere, nowhere, right? Ukrainians that had to flee were welcome in the U.S. with no problem. The U.S. has the capacity to allow immigrants to come with no problem whatsoever. So how come we don't do that for Haitians? for people from Haiti? How come we don't do it for people from, from Guatemala, from Mexico, from India, from China? It is a racialized system and that's why we're continue fighting. And we invite you to come with us to the detention center. We're gonna be out there again every month. We are out there. Next Saturday at 1 p.m. we wait for you. As we come here, we want you to go there because the fight is not only here. Ground zero for us is the detention center in Tacoma. So come and join us and support the leadership of those detained. Those that are right now in prison and are fighting and recently went on hunger strike and they were gassed because they speak up. The Geo Corporation used gas against them. They put him in solitary confinement. Another guy was beat up just because he took a sandwich and he was taken to medical and then he was placed in solitary confinement as a punishment. So we need to continue fighting and we need you. Every single one of you needs to be there with us next Saturday at 1 p.m. out right outside the detention center. We're reclaiming the space. We're reclaiming the land back to the Puyallup where it should be already. And we're reclaiming the closing of the detention center immediately, the release of absolutely everyone that is detained right now and reparations for every single person that has gone through that. 
fucking detention system. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you for coming to speak. All right, we got Jane coming on for answer. So I'm not even going to introduce Jane. I'll just let Jane come and speak. Hi, everybody. Not only is this the 20th anniversary of the second, second U.S. war on Iraq, it is also the 20th anniversary of the killing of our Rachel Corey, a young woman from Olympia, Washington, and an evergreen student who was killed by, US, by the U.S.-backed apartheid Israeli military. She was nonviolently blocking the destruction of a Palestinian home that was being destroyed, and an Israeli bulldozer ran her over and killed her. So I want you to think about her, though. Yes, it is a shame, but also, we need to remember her spirit and be inspired by it. Rachel Corey, presente. We all say presente. I joined the anti-war movement when I was 16 years old. That was at a time when Jimmy Carter had just reinstated registration for the draft during the Iran hostage crisis, and it was also the beginnings of the U.S. covert intervention into Afghanistan. We, the young activists at that time, we looked up to and we wanted to emulate the generation before us, the anti-Vietnam War activists who had organized so tirelessly to end the Vietnam War. Over the years, other youth came into our movement, those who were opposing U.S. intervention in Central America and the Caribbean from El Salvador to Nicaragua, as well as uh, the protests against the U.S. invasion of Grenada and then Panama. And then we had the first U.S. genocidal Iraq war that started in uh, 1991 and was followed by the period of sanctions, genocidal sanctions, sanctions which are a form of war. And then we had 9-11 and the, the inauguration of what we now call the era of endless wars that we are fighting now to end. 20 years ago, with the beginning of that endless war, Numerous people flooded into the streets to stop the war. Now those young people, just like Rachel Corey, are middle-aged people. If she hadn't been killed, they would be, she would be middle-aged as well. Meanwhile, some of our stalwart anti-imperialist and anti-war militants have left us. Here in Seattle, I would like to uplift some names, and I'd like you, as I say them, to say, Presente! because their spirit and their memory should be inspiring us to continue the struggle. We need to connect to the people who have gone before us. There were three activists who were very central to the work of the Answer Coalition. One was Jack Whitehouse. He was uh, very active in, sol in addition to working with Answer, he was very active in solidarity with the struggle for native sovereignty and freedom for Leonard Peltier. And he often organized our security and in fact, he would be sitting right here behind the stage, making sure that nobody interfered with what we were doing. Andy Freeman, often known as the human bullhorn, because he didn't need one. He worked tirelessly behind the scenes to help organize many protests. Best known, Dorley Rainey. She was the octogenarian activist who was brutally pepper sprayed also, right here at Westlake in 2011 at an Occupy protest, and her photograph went viral. Her photograph went viral all over the world. Um, we also recently lost Jean Darcy here in Seattle, one of the women in black and a longtime anti-war activist, as well as Gary Owens, a key social justice organizer and Cuba solidarity activist. As we think of them, let us be inspired by them. Their spirits, their memory inspire us today as we rebuild and bring in new generations of activists into a multicultural, multi-gender, multi-generational movement for peace with justice. We are building a movement that rejects the lies and phony narratives that our enemies, the warmongers, want to use to divide us. That Russia or China or Iran or Cuba or somebody else is our enemy or that boomers and millennials should all hate each other for some unknown reason. We honor the legacy of those who went before us, whose shoulders we stand on, 
And we know we need to continually grow, filling our ranks with young people so we can advance in building a movement that can end these brutal wars once and for all and create a world based on peace and cooperation. One thing we need to do to build this movement, one thing we need is to have money. Whether you call it cold hard cash, folding money, dead presidents, or Venmo, please give generously so we can move forward from today to continue to build this movement. Thank you. One thing that Jane brought up is we definitely got to keep in mind the people that came before us and that paved the way and the shoulders that we're standing on to, to continue these, these, these organizations and to continue to push forward. And we want to appreciate those people that came before us and those people that are still here and still fighting to, to make a change, to make a difference. So the next speaker that we have up is Mateo um, from UW Progressive Student Union. And it's a multi-issue organization at the UW. Um, and it's a chapter of the National SDS, focused on direct action. All right, coming up. Hello, my name is Mathieu Chabot, and I'm a member of the Progressive Student Union at the University of Washington. We want to talk today about the student movement's role in the anti-war movement and the need to uphold that legacy. In the 70s, Students for Democratic Society, whose legacy we maintain, organized itself against the Vietnam War. The action they took includes strikes, sit-ins, and teach-ins, and demonstrations against military contractors and other campus recruiters, similar to what we are doing right now, here today. This was not easy. They were met with police violence along the way, and worse. Despite this, instead of relying only on doing petitions and pickets, they continued to choose to be militant in their tactics. They took actions every day within universities and their communities across the nation, and it's up to us to do the same. They were not alone in the fight against the Vietnam War as well. For example, in Kent State University, where the infamous Kent State Massacre took place, SDS worked with black unified students to protest the Vietnam War. Without unity, none of their actions would have been possible, and without unity, none of our actions would be possible. The Kent State Massacre was the worst repression that SDS was faced with by the state, and a tragedy that killed four students. It did not come out of nowhere, actions were being taken on campus in the days leading up to the massacre. The, this act, these actions culminated in the ROTC building going up in flames, burning imperialism down to the ground. And on May 4th, 1970, the National Guard reacted to that, and they opened fire on students. Hundreds had gathered on a hill to protest the expansion of the Vietnam War into Cambodia, a clear growth of U.S. imperialism, and the response of the National Guard was to disperse them. When tear gas wasn't enough, the, st the soldiers fired on the students. Four students died that day, and several others were crippled. These students fought and died for the struggle against imperialism. They are no different from me or you. They went to classes, they had friends, and they had family. Three of them were 19, one was 20. The student movement today continues to face repression. SDS today began in response to the Iraq War, picking up the struggle from where, from where SDS in the 70s was, was ended by the state. We have chapters today nationwide taking up the fight to defend diversity in education across the nation and take on imperialism and capitalism. This struggle is not easy. Just last Monday, March 6th, four SDS members in Tampa were arrested for protesting. The student movement nationwide came together in solidarity and bailed them out out of jail. And today, they are able to speak in Washington, D.C. at a rally similar to this one this morning. When I say that we need to uphold the legacy of SDS and build our own, I mean that we need to continue to be militant. All petitions and pickets might have their use, they aren't enough. We need to do more. When the U.S. government spends billions in the military every year for the purpose of bombing and looting foreign countries, a petition won't stop them. As the U.S. continues to escalate, as it continues to decimate and pillage the global south, we must continue to fight and struggle. We must uphold the legacy of those who died at Kent State and everybody else who has struggled before and after them. Remember those who died at Kent State and remember all of those others who have struggled. Remember Sandra Shore. 
Remember Jeffrey Miller. Remember Alison Krauss. Remember William Schroeder. Justice for them, justice for the Tampa Four, and freedom for the oppressed peoples of the world. We must fight to uphold what they fought for. We must fight for ourselves. And we must fight for our future. Dare to struggle, dare to win. 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 Thank you. Give it up for SDS and their decades of work against the uh, against war and their work in the anti-war movement. And I want to ask, are you still with me? Yeah. Are you still here to demand an end to war? Yeah. We're gonna start another chant. Biggest threat to the world today, NATO and the USA. Biggest threat to the world today. against nuclear weapons in the fall of 2019 as part of the effort to understand the intersection of U.S. militarism and the climate crisis. Give it up for Mary. Yeah. Greetings, greetings from 350 Seattle, Seattle Anti-War Coalition that we're a member of. We're also a member of Washington Against Nuclear Weapons, another of the endorsers today rally. Uh, I want to acknowledge that we are right here, I believe, on Duwamish land and thank them indirectly uh, for that. I want to I wanna also acknowledge my own heritage. I'm the daughter, granddaughter, and great-granddaughter of immigrants to this country from Ireland and Scotland and England. They were carpet weavers. They were coal miners. They were cabinet makers. Uh, my mother herself was a union leader down in the Bay Area where I'm from. And I just want to acknowledge my own personal lineage. Uh, you heard that Seattle Anti-War Coalition recently organized a uh, pro-peace anti-war talk by Medea Benjamin here in Seattle. And we got canceled not only once, but twice. It was bizarre. And uh, uh, that was just a few days ago. It was to be at the uh, university bookstore, and then it was to be at a nearby church, university congregational. And they both got pushback. They got pushback from some named and unnamed sources that we should not be talking about peace in Ukraine. We should not be talking about the path to peace in Ukraine through negotiations and ceasefire. Since when was negotiations a dangerous word? But it was enough of a threat to, for us to be canceled. And so it's really important for us to be out here today under the sky where we cannot be canceled and talk about peace, talk about negotiations. Um, I want to try to share with you some of what I've been learning uh, with 350 Seattle, a climate justice organization that believes with you all in deep system change. Because all of our struggles are interconnected and we cannot achieve climate justice without racial justice, immigration justice, gender justice, class justice, economic justice, all these things are intertwined as everyone here knows. Um, I want to point out some of the things that I've been learning about U.S. militarism and its contribution both direct and indirect to uh, climate change and env environmental destruction. Actually, the U.S. military is the biggest industrial emitter, the biggest industrial user of fossil fuels in the world. It's not the number one. If the U.S. military were a nation, this is according to Brown University study, the cost of war, which uh, is, is, is a great resource for all of us in this intersectional area of climate and peace. If it were a nation, the, the United States military would be about number 50 out of 200 in its use of fossil fuels and its emissions. So it's important not to exaggerate 
or to understate the, the direct consequences of U.S. militarism. But it's actually a lot worse than just our burning of fossil fuels, that is the U.S. military's burning of fossil fuels or its emissions. It's worse than that. The United States military has something like 800 bases in 80 countries around the world, vastly outnumbering, vastly uh, our supposed enemies, Russia and China. Uh, those uh, military bases around the world are responsible for environmental devastation wherever they go. And uh, this has to do with, uh, you know, from the pollutants of uh, fire extinguishing PFAS chemicals uh, to direct theft of land to uh, the poisoning of water and land uh, with even things like um, spent bullets on the, the big rifle range in Guam, for example. So there's environmental devastation just from our military presence and the oppression of people that those military presences mean in those 80 countries around the world. Uh, I want to point out, too, some other things that I've learned about environmental destruction when we're at war. Uh, for example, in Afghanistan, the deforestation of Afghanistan is in part due to uh, the direct uh, uh, destruction of forests in Afghanistan, once a beautifully forested country. And the people of Afghanistan rely heavily on the wood for fuel. But not only direct uh, destruction of the forests of Afghanistan, but because the farmlands have been mined, uh, the farmers are cutting down trees themselves to find farmland where they can actually grow food and survive. So that's one example. Another that is well known is uh, in, uh, in the Marshall Islands and the absolute devastation of the people and the landscape of the Marshall Islands, the wildlife, because of the testing of nuclear weapons. Uh, and I want to point out one other thing, all of us here in Washington State. Washington State not only is a home of Boeing, but it's the, the home of the Hanford nuclear processing plant where uranium was uh, converted into plutonium that went into the bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki in 1945. As a result of the development of nuclear weapons here in Washington State, the Columbia River is the most radioactive river in the world. And the site at Hanford is the biggest Superfund site in the Western Hemisphere. The only reason we don't say it's the biggest Superfund site in the world is that there's Chernobyl. So let me point out, lastly, uh, some other connections that we, we have to get used to making. My own analysis, as you can tell, is, is pretty, uh, is, it, it, it's pretty elementary. I have a long ways to go. But Ukraine, Ukraine, let's think about the Ukraine for a minute, why it's so important to press for negotiations or a ceasefire by some means, uh, a ceasefire negotiation for peace. Ukraine is the first time that war has been fought in a nation that depends primarily on nuclear energy. Uh, there are four or five major nuclear power plants around Ukraine. If any one of them uh, loses its energy, or if it loses its energy, if it loses its backup source of energy, a meltdown will occur. This is apart from the danger of nuclear war in Ukraine. I also want to point out something that is not widely known. Widely known is that Ukraine produces a lot of wheat. And recently on International Women's Day, a story, a headline I heard, Democracy Now, uh, pointed out that pregnant and nursing mothers in many African countries are malnourished because of the lack of wheat uh, being exported from Ukraine to Africa, even with agreements in place. But I, I want to point out something that's, that's not widely known. Uh, Ukraine has also got significant lithium deposits, lithium deposits. So as we, as we uh, try to get into this, this new world of, of a sustainable energy systems globally, 
we have to keep in mind that uh, not to create through imperialism new new reasons for war. That is, if all we do is convert to electrification via battery, we will be and already are entering a time when there will be struggles fought for lithium globally. And I just wonder, uh, in the in the many corporations that are profiting from the war in Ukraine, whether the energy companies who are profiting are not only fossil fuel energy companies, but those looking ahead to a lithium dependent uh, energy future. Uh, so let me just close by saying, we have to talk about peace. Uh, we will be, uh, they will attempt to silence us, uh, but we have to keep talking about it wherever we go in the, in the, in, in the most informed and with the deepest analysis that we, we possibly can. So I wanna thank Taylor and Drew for emceeing us today and answer for initiating this and hope that we will continue in this struggle together. Thank you. Mary is right. In order for the people and the planet to survive, we have to stop the US war machine. So let's start, let's do another chant. From Palestine to the Philippines, stop the US war machine. From Palestine to the Philippines, stop the US war machine. From Palestine to the Philippines, stop the US war machine. From Palestine to the Philippines, stop the US war machine. This global oppressive system will die so that the people and planet can live. We are moving on to our last four speakers. Thank you so much for staying here and showing your support. The reason we have so many speakers is because we want you to get involved in an organization. Organized mass movements are what bring about change in this country and it is what will bring about change in, in how the U.S. pursues war. When we show that the people are against war, that is when the U.S. will stop. When we seize the power, when workers are in control, that is when the, this war and all the warmongering will stop. So please welcome our next speaker, Callie, with the Party for Socialism and Liberation, a revolutionary socialist organization that believes in the death of capitalism so that the people and planet can live. Thank you. All right. Thank you all for being here. It's amazing to see so many people out here to say no to war. The war in Ukraine is a tragedy. Countless people have died. Eight million, more than eight million refugees have fled Ukraine, three million to, uh, to Russia, 1.5 million to Poland, hundreds of thousands to countries all throughout Europe and throughout the world. Ukrainians struggle for access to food and medicine. Meanwhile, Russians are living under economic sanctions. Ukrainians and Russians face conscription to fight and die in this war. Global supply chains have been disrupted, causing a drop in the standard of living for people all around the world. And the real shame on top of all of this, is that it was preventable and avoidable. Now, the security claims among uh, Russians about the eastward expansion of NATO and the proliferation of weapons in Eastern Europe along the Russian border are legitimate and genuine, and they were ignored for decades. That doesn't justify the decision to invade Ukraine. Ukrainians deserve sovereignty. They deserve to live and to rebuild everything that they've lost. Peace talks, negotiations have been held several times over the past year. This is the way forward. There is no military solution to this war. So we say yes to negotiations and no to 
our government's policy of escalation of this war, prolonging the war. The U.S. government policy of escalation is a central obstacle to peace. And it puts the entire world in danger of confrontation between two or more nuclear powers. We also demand an end to NATO. NATO is a military alliance between imperialist nations. We demand the demilitarization of all of Europe, the removal of all U.S. military troops, missiles, and nuclear weapons from Europe. This is how peace in Europe is possible. But this won't ensure an end to war. We know that war is an inevitability as long as the world is divided into states run by and for the wealthy and powerful, the capitalist elites, we can only win peace, we can only end war by fighting for socialism. When power is in the hands of working and oppressed people, when we have real democracy, then we can see an end to war. Because we don't win in any war, least of all the imperialist wars that have not stopped for so long. The only ones who win those wars, the only, one, the only winners in war, are the wealthy and powerful who dominate this world right now. The only ones who win are the capitalist class, the ruling class. So we say, to end war, win socialism. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Callie, appreciate that. Um, and I think I am just introducing Amy, the co-chair of Seattle DSA. Uh, my name is Amy. I'm a co-chair of Seattle DSA and member of Marxist Unity Group, a uh, faction within DSA. Um, so we're here to talk about the war in Ukraine. Uh, of course we want Russia out. Of course we want it, what's best for the Ukrainian people. But do we want the U.S. trying to fight that war? Who stands to gain from that? That's what we have to ask ourselves. When the U.S. buys its own weapons and makes Ukraine pay for it, who stands to gain? When the U.S. escalates, when the U.S. places sanctions, wages total war against the people, the civilians of Russia, when the U.S. when the U.S. holds forward a war when the U.S. keeps the war going, held up by, propped up by conscripts who get nearly no training thrown straight into a meat grinder. Who stands to gain? Not the Ukrainian people. That's right, military industrial complex. Our own Boeing, our own Lockheed Martin. There are enemies. As we know, the main enemy is at home. I didn't have a whole lot prepared to say today, but that's the question we have to ask ourselves. Who stands to gain, and what would really be good for, for those? We talk about self-determination. Self we believe in that. I'm, I'm here speaking for MUG and for Democratic Socialists of America. We believe in democracy, not the false democracy that the United States exports, not the democracy that has said, you're part of our empire now. We, we, your resources are ours and your wars are ours. We believe in a democracy that puts people in control, that, puts, that gives power to the people. 
That's not something that we'll get with U.S. weapons, with U.S. tanks, with NATO overseeing it. Thank you. All right, thank you, Amy, with um, GSA. And next, we are going to, these are our last two speakers. Um, I'd like to introduce Kathy Railsback um, with Ground Zero. She's a resident activist at the Ground Center, Zero Center for Nonviolent Action. She's worked on campaigns for women's and immigrants' rights, environmental justice, and for peace and against militarism. An immigration attorney for more than 25 years, she has worked with war and torture survivors from many countries. She and her husband live at the Ground Zero Center, adjacent to the Trident Nuclear Submarine Base in Kitsap County, Washington, which houses over 1,000 nuclear warheads, the largest concentration of deployed nuclear warheads in the Western Hemisphere. Please welcome Kathy. Thank you, and thank you. Thank you all for coming, and thanks to our organizers. And thank you for the privilege of letting me speak today. I'm going to focus mostly on the environmental impacts of the war, but I have to mention a couple of related items, the reasons why, why I'm opposed. First, the war is causing widespread trauma and suffering, which I believe will lead to more violence. We know trauma affects not only those who directly experience traumatic ex events, but to their families and then to their communities and to their descendants. Many people and institutions today pride themselves on being trauma-informed. It's well past time for us to adopt a trauma-informed public foreign policy. Uh, we don't think about all the trauma that we're causing with these, with these massive weapons exports. Estimates are that there have been well over 100,000 killed or injured on each side. We, one can only begin to imagine the amount of trauma that's been caused by this conflict. Moreover, those who inflict the harm, the soldiers that are fighting, and their, and their families and their communities, they too experience trauma symptoms with all their far-reaching and devastating impacts. Secondly, as has been mentioned, more than eight, the enormous refugee flows, more than eight million refugees fled from Ukraine. The UN calls this the fastest and one of the largest forced displacement crises since World War II. This flow has contributed to the world reaching the highest number of those displaced by war, violence, persecution, and human rights abuses, over 100 million, since records were kept. We have long had an appetite for conflict, we in the U.S., but we're not willing to clean up the mess afterwards. Uh, this includes, uh, this applies both to healing the people involved and also to literally cleaning the environment. Just witness the, the many military Superfund sites here in the U.S. and worldwide. Third, neither our country nor the world can afford the cost of a war like this. We've already spent tens of billions, an enormous amount. We've sent tens of billions to a country widely viewed as plagued by endemic corruption. Much of this money is going for destructive rather than constructive purposes. The money is desperately needed here and elsewhere around the world. Soon we're going to be asked to begin paying for reconstruction of an estimated 750 billion in infrastructure damage to roads, buildings, airports, schools, electrical systems, etc. And some of this damage has been caused by the very weapons that we provided. So first we spend all this money on the weapons, they destroy all these things, and then we have to go back and we have to pay for all the reconstruction costs. It's idiotic. Uh, we're sending so many weapons so fast that we cannot keep track of them, as happened in Iraq and Afghanistan. Our national budget must more accurately reflect where our heart, where our heart is. So I want to talk now about the intersection between war and the environment. Our health and our well-being are inextricably linked to the health and the well-being of the planet. I'm going to say that again. Our health as humans and our well-being are inextricably linked to the health and the well-being of our planet. It makes sense. Uh, as Jane Fonda said very elegantly a few weeks ago, we're pooping in our own kennels So with these wars. So our planet is suffering right now from climate change. And the war is having, the war is exacerbating these impacts. 
is having a devastating impact on international food supplies, inflation, and fuel prices. The number of people suffering from or at risk of acute food insecurity more than doubled from 135 million in 2019 to 345 million in 2022. Ukraine has been known as the breadbasket of the world, able to feed 400 million people outside the country. It's irresponsible and it's immoral for us to support conflict that is so contributing to extreme food insecurity among the world's most vulnerable populations. From pastoralists in East Africa who have lost their entire herds and livelihoods, to farmers in Ukraine whose fields are, are so heavily mined that they don't know when they're gonna be able to farm again. We can't let this continue and we cannot contribute to this. In October, uh, the UN Environmental, the UN Environment uh, Program did a, did a preliminary review of all the, all the damage that's been done in Ukraine. It's a good report, I recommend it to anybody. But one of their quotes is, uh, they say, initial information shows that Ukraine, already burdened by a host of legacy environmental challenges, is now facing a compounded, multi-dimensional environmental crisis that has either exacerbated existing issues or added new ones. It is essential that the ongoing conflict ends now to ensure greater damage to the environment and to people is averted. The country and the region risk being burdened with a toxic legacy long after the conflict ends. So the report documents all kinds of problems uh, with chemicals, with munitions, with military equipment, pollutants released during combat, damage to fuel storage facilities, industrial infrastructure, water and energy and waste management systems, and damage in urban, agricultural, natural areas. As we know, modern warfare, including military preparedness, involves enormous use of fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are called the lifeblood of the U.S. armed forces. So I want to mention something that I don't know. How many of you have heard of the Manchester Fuel Depot? Raise your hand. The Manchester Fuel Depot uh, per the Navy, the U.S. Navy, it's the largest fuel depot in the continental U.S. It's also referred to as the Pentagon's largest gas station. So the, the location of this place is located near where I live. Uh, it's in Kitsap County, Washington, not far from here. Uh, it's one mile north of the town of Manchester near Rich Passage and Clam Bay. It's about one mile uh, from Fort Ward Park on Bainbridge Island and six miles west of Alki Beach in West Seattle. So you've got the Pentagon's largest gas station, uh, six miles, and it's, it's right by the water. It's six miles from, from Alki Beach. So let me just tell you a few things about this, this fuel depot. Uh, it stores and dis it was built in, in the World War II era in, the, in that fog of war one of the many fogs of war that causes people to do crazy things. So the depot stores and distributes aviation fuels and marine diesel to the Navy, Department of Defense, and allied forces from other countries in the Pacific region. It has 34 enormous underground fuel storage tanks, most built in the 40s. In 2017, the depot held more than 75 million gallons of fuel. Uh, over the next 10 years, they plan to build six new above-ground storage tanks, uh, each one which will hold 5 million gallons of fuel. They haven't talked about what they're going to do. They're, go they're going to take out some of the underground storage ones because they know that it's an environmental hazard. So they've, uh, they've announced that they're going to take care of eight of them. They're leaving the other 26 or haven't announced any other plans uh, about these storage tanks. They have leaked in the past. and. So in, in February 1990, there was a spill of about 38,000 to 40,000 gallons at one of the tanks. Uh, and there was another, another spill of diesel fuel of about 10,000 gallons. Um, this contaminates the soil and the groundwater. In another tank, there was a two inch diameter hole and there are petroleum hydrocarbons in the soil and groundwater. So very few people know about this place and, and there's a reason for that, we, we believe. 
So I hope you'll, Ground Zero and some other allied organizations are doing an Earth Day action on, on Saturday, April 27th. There's some little flyers that I have, and you can find it on the website for the Ground Zero Center for Nonviolent Action um, to learn about this. We'll also be doing a Mother's Day event where we're focusing on planting. So I'll just close with every day I sit at my desk at the Ground Zero Center for Nonviolent Action is 1.4 miles from the Trident submarine base, which houses more than 1,000 nuclear warheads, the largest concentration of deployed nuclear weapons in the Western Hemisphere. So it's about like a little bit more than an hour from here. It's not far. Uh, so these, these weapons are capable of destroying life on Earth as we know it many times over. So naturally, this could be a reason for despair. Uh, however, also on our property at, at the Ground Zero Center, and I'll just mention the Ground Zero Center was purchased by activists, anti-war activists in the 70s. These were the same people that sat on train tracks to block trains uh, that were delivering nuclear weapons to the base. They tried to keep the base from having being uh, armed with nuclear weapons. They, they were valiant and heroic. Um, and they still are. They're still there. <laughs> they're still there. Uh, they're still there protesting the nuclear weapons regularly. So as I mentioned, it could be reason for despair, but also on this 3.8 property is a forest. We have a northwest forest and it's full of 100 foot cedars and pines. It has ferns of many different kinds, mushrooms of many different kinds, birds, squirrels, rabbits, coyotes, and even we saw three bears on Thanksgiving. Uh, so I've learned a lot from this environment, uh, and the beauty and the variety gives me hope. At this time of war, hysteria, and fear, we need to have steadiness, steadiness and sturdiness and level heads to counter the fog of war that leads to chaos and recklessness, uh, the destruction of lives and the planet. Nature can help us. I believe that nature can help us. It has helped me. Deepening our connection with the environment around us, caring for it and letting it care for us. This can give us the sturdiness and steadiness and calm and determination that we need to stop this destructive and wasteful war. Thank you. Thanks for that, Kathy. All right, I'm gonna move us right into the Panther Party um, and for Dosere to come up. And the Panther Party is an organization that works in solidarity with the Black Panther Party. So. Afternoon, comrades. So I know my, uh, my comrade Bunchy already gave a definition of imperialism, um, but I'm the, uh, I'm the Minister of Education for the Panther Party. I'd like to give a different one. I'd like to give the one we use in our political education classes. And that is the highest stage of capitalism in which capitalist countries and organizations maintain systems of oppression through a combination of military force and global monopoly on finance capital. We're here today to speak out against imperialist warmongering that has led to the continued crisis in Ukraine and is on the verge of precipita precipitating a war with the People's Republic of China. We have every right and we have every reason to make these demands. We have every right and every reason to demand an end to imperialist war and military brinksmanship. We know that the money spent on weapons for Ukraine could be spent feeding our families, housing the unhoused, caring for the ill. We know that imperialist support of neo-Nazis during, during the Maidan coup and the installation of a proxy government in Ukraine played a huge role in starting this war. We know that, regardless of the war hawks' braggadocious claims, no one wins a nuclear war, and we are on the verge of nuclear war. Most of all, we know the imperial violence abroad is the same imperial violence we suffer at home. We know that the same military-industrial complex arms both the Azov Brigade and the pigs at home. We know that the violent tactics used to enforce the apartheid and genocide in Gaza are taught to our police by Israeli stormtroopers. So that they may in turn use it against us. We know that the same bourgeois interests that control this country's domestic policy likewise control uh, its foreign policy. And in both cases, 
their, they, to their benefit and to the people's detriment. We know that international wars are manifestations of the global class war. But what we also know is this. Well, we have every right and every reason to demand that this madness stop, it is not within the ability of the imperialist system to end this madness any more than it is within the ability of a shark to stop swimming. Capitalism makes war a necessity. It must eternally expand, and expansion requires conquest. Imperialism is born of colonialism built on slavery and fed by blood. Rishi Sunak stated recently that Russia's war in Ukraine and China's aggression over Taiwan threaten to create a world defined by danger, disorder, and division. But for the victims of imperialism, most of us, most of humanity, the world has been defined by danger, disorder, and division for a long, long time. Danger, disorder, and division are not something that have just recently been thrust upon us by Russia and China. Wherever capitalism, wherever class society exists, the reality for the people is one of danger, disorder, and division. The danger of the overseer, the bomb, or the tin man. The disorder of a dysfunctional and chaotic economic system that leaves many out in the cold and fails to prepare for crises. The division of patriarchy, chauvinism, and white supremacy. Ask the people of Iraq the victims of the American prison slave system, or the folks sleeping on the street, what fills their life with danger, disorder, and division, and see how many say Russia and China. Yeah. Of course the ruling class understands this. Their concern is not with danger or disorder, but with a danger or disorder that is not tailored to suit their interests. Here at home, landlords evict us. The prison industrial complex imprisons and enslaves us. Corporations poison us and pigs beat and murder us. But it's only when we fight back that we hear the ruling class speak of violence. When the ruling class, the fascists and the liberals condemn is not violence, but rather any violation of their monopoly on violence. Yeah. It is at home. As it is at home, so it is abroad. They are concerned with danger only when it is not for their cause. And again, these are the same folks. The same people waging imperialist wars abroad are also waging a war against us at home. They want nothing more than for the people of the world to fight each other on their behalf, to do their bleeding and dying for them. Because if we are fighting each other, that means we can't be fighting them. They will try to convince us that we should fight in erroneous wars between nations so that we do not fight in the real war, the only real war, and that is a class war. The ruling class wages imperialist wars because they must in order to survive. We the people demand an end to imperialist wars because the wars must end if we are to survive. And that places us at an intractable existential contradiction. The only way for war to end is for imperialism to end. The only thing that will end the war is the people's victory in the class war. The only thing that will end the war is the people's, is, the only solution is revolution. That is why we say no war but class war, and that is why we say peace, if you're willing to fight for it. All power to the people! Let's make some noise for all our speakers today! As we close out here today, we know that this cannot be the end, and it will not be the end. We will make sure of that. The U.S. will escalate and increase its global power dominance, whether it's in Ukraine or Taiwan, and we need to be there when it does. Now is the time to be bold in our peaceful convictions and fierce in our determination to spread this increasingly important message. The media wants us to be confused, but we are not confused. We do not think it's noble to spend hundreds of billions of dollars to fight to the last Ukrainian. We know all wars have ended at the negotiating table, and we know wars end when powerful mass movements are in the streets demanding their end. 